Good morning, Cornerstone Church. Thank you for joining us this morning for Palm Sunday. It is a beautiful day. We're excited to worship with you. But before we get started, let's open in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. God, as we celebrate the entering of the King into Jerusalem, O oh God, Palm Sunday, Lord, as the people declared Hosanna, as they welcomed the King of Kings into the Holy City. And today, we welcome the King of Kings into our hearts, into our presence this morning. God, we want to worship you. We know that only through you, salvation comes. So Lord, we ask you to bless this time, bless the service. We ask it in the most awesome and loving and most precious name of Jesus. And everyone said,
why we hope, this why we hope, for you have rescued us. That's why we sing, that's why we sing, by the name of Jesus. That's why we live, that's why we live, for you have first loved us. That's why we love, that's why we love, love, love.
us in perfection You gave your life for us And we are amazed As we stand in awe For we have been changed By the power of the cross How great, how great How great is your love How great, how great
with your victory You lost your grip on me For the sun has set me free Resurrection Sunday as we celebrate Palm Sunday today and I pray Lord that we would just feel the heaviness, the volumes of your love the price that you paid God there is no greater hope than the hope that we find in the name of Jesus 
Lord, I pray, God, that you would just convict our hearts right now. That there's areas in our life that sometimes we allow to get in the way of us truly seeing you, God. Truly experiencing you. Truly encountering you. Sometimes we put so many other things in front of you. But God, you're more than life. You're more than priority. God, you're everything to us. Your life and eternal life. Your salvation and eternal. God, you're so awesome, Lord. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. we can do this morning is just give you our full attention give you our worship you deserve honor and praise and I pray Lord that you prepare our hearts for what you're going to speak this morning Lord as the word is spoken as the word of God is spoken Lord I pray that it would just change us that we would truly understand we would truly recognize God how great your love is for us took our place, Lord. She paid our place. We give you everything. In the most loving name of Jesus. Everyone said Good morning, Cornerstone community. Pastor Paul here. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for our Palm Sunday service. I pray that this message finds you well. As we continue our shelter in place, I know that it's a trying season at this time, which is why I pray that the Lord continue to shelter you with His love and His grace. As believers, it's important for us to recognize that God has a purpose even in a season like this. It's important for us to realize that God can turn around what the enemy meant for evil and use it for good. He also says in Romans that God works together all things for good for those who love Him and walk according to His ways. So as believers in Christ, we need to change our perspective to know that God is doing something during this season. Most importantly, He wants us to share the hope and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. People are looking for answers right now. People are searching for a hope, and that hope is only found in Jesus. So it's important for us to use our conversations, to use our social media platforms, to use any communication that we make, to use it for encouragement, to bring hope to a dark world. It's important for us to also realize that during this season that we could draw closer to our families, to build stronger relationships, and to make Christ the center of our homes. So let's not take it for granted, but use this time wisely to use this time to give Him glory in everything that we do. I'm so excited to continue the series this morning, but before we do, let's get started off with our Bible declaration. So please grab your Bibles in your hands and repeat after me. Say, this is the Bible, the indestructible, the infallible, living Word of God. He wrote it and I believe it. My mind is focused. My heart is open. My spirit is ready to receive it now. I will never be the same. I will be forever changed. In Jesus' most precious name. Amen. I want to start off this morning by asking you to imagine yourself sitting in this chair. Comfortable? Eh, I'm sure you've had more comfy chairs to sit in before. 
but it does not look threatening at all, right? But what if I told you that this chair that you're sitting in is really placed in this courtroom? What if I told you that you were in the guilty seat? What if I told you that the penalty of your crime was death? What thoughts run through your mind? What are your emotions? How do you feel at this moment? This morning, we're going to take you on the perspective of someone who was guilty, someone who was sentenced to death, but was set free. But at what price and at whose expense? This morning, we continue our eye-opening series, Journey to the Cross. Last week and the week leading up to Resurrection Sunday, we are journeying with you through the Gospels on the road to the cross, from the road to Jerusalem, to the Roman courts of Pontius Pilate, to the cross at Calvary, and to the tomb of the resurrected Christ. You know, our Lord Jesus Christ came not just to be a great teacher, a miracle maker, or a humble servant, but He came ultimately for one purpose, to bring salvation and forgiveness for you and I. On this journey, we're not going to only see the lives Christ touched and changed forever, but we will see each of us in the people that Jesus would reveal His mercy, amazing grace, and unconditional love to. This unique aspect of this series is that every message will focus on a specific person in each passage and how each one of them is a fitting representation of you and I. I've entitled part two of this series, He Took Our Place. And today we're going to see through the eyes of Barabbas, a rebel sentenced to death, but set free through Jesus Christ. We have two passages to read this morning. So please open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 23, verse 23 to 25. Our first passage is Luke chapter 23, verse 23 to 25. Let's read it together, the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. But he delivered Jesus to their will. And our second passage comes from Matthew chapter 27, verse 24 to 26. Matthew chapter 27, verse 24 to 26. Let's read it together, the count of three. One, two, three. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. This is the word of God. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to receive your word this morning. Lord, I pray, God, as we journey together through the Gospels, as we see the account of Barabbas this morning, Lord, I pray that you would open up our heart and our mind to truly receive what you have in store for us, God. Let us understand, God, that you took our place that you were the great substitute, Lord. And I thank you, God, that you would choose to humble yourself and pay the price that we could not pay. Lord, we honor you this morning. And as your messenger, I pray that you would take over, take control, that you would use me as your instrument. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Now let me give you a little bit of background. Israel at this time was being controlled by the Roman Empire. Since 587 BC, since the destruction of the first temple, Israel would be under the control of other empires. And during this time, the time of Jesus, the Roman Empire was overseeing Israel. We see in the Old Testament that Israel began to sin against God and turn away from Him, thus leading to the downfall of Israel. 
For more than 500 years, Israel waited for a promised Messiah. They waited for someone that would free them from being controlled by these empires. They pictured the Messiah as a political power. They pictured him as someone who would rise up and lead a revolt that would ultimately free their nation. But as they waited for their so-called Messiah, they started their own rebellions against the Roman Empire. And in history books, you see the revolts and rebellions throughout the years. Now in Mark 15, 7, it reads, And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. According to Luke 23, 19, it says there had been an uprising in the city. And one of the rebels was a man named Barabbas. Now Barabbas was one who was involved in that rebellion, or what we call an insurrection. He was an insurrectionist. Now what is an insurrectionist? An insurrectionist is someone who acts in rebellion against the civil authority or established government. Look, theft or robbery was not a capital offense, but insurrection definitely was, which is why Barabbas and his fellow rebels were held for this capital offense, which is why they were being sentenced to death. Some scholars say he may have been a member of what they call the Zealots, who were a group of Jews who rebelled against the Romans. He and his fellow rebels were eventually caught and imprisoned, waiting for their execution. They were charged for revolution and for murder. Imagine Barabbas waiting in his prison cell, looking at his hands that will soon be crucified. Imagine the fear and apprehension and the emotional and physical stress that Barabbas and his fellow rebels are experiencing at this time. And he begins to hear the crowds gathering outside. We know that the prisons were not that far away from the Roman courts, for prisoners would often be transported there to be sentenced. Barabbas and his fellow rebels, they faced their last moments of life knowing that the punishment of their crime would result in the most horrible, excruciating, and disgraceful execution possible. Death by crucifixion. He begins to hear the crowds getting louder and louder. He does not know exactly what is happening, but a deeper sense of fear and dread takes over his whole body, assuming that his time has now come. All of a sudden, he hears the people shouting. Imagine what Barabbas must be feeling at this moment. Now, let us see what is actually happening outside the Roman courts. Barabbas is trying to put two and two together. He hears people shouting his name, Barabbas, Barabbas. And then minutes later, he hears, crucify him, crucify him. So if you're Barabbas and you're putting two and two together, you're thinking, okay, I'm in for it now. They're calling my name, and I'm, I'm about to be crucified. But let us see what is actually happening outside in the Roman courts. The crowds gathered, especially the Jewish leaders who have accused Jesus Christ and are making sure that he does not slip out of their fingers. Christ had already been previously sent to Herod, and then Herod sends him back to Pilate. During this time, as Jesus is being transported, he's being spit upon, he's being thrown to the ground, he's being beat up. And Herod says, this is a, this is a issue for Pilate. You send him back to Pontius Pilate. So they send him back to Pilate, and the Jewish leaders do not want to let Christ slip out of their hands. And they will do anything possible to make sure that he is sentenced. In Matthew 27, 19, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, Pontius Pilate, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. So Pontius Pilate's wife goes to Pontius Pilate and says, Don't have anything to do with that just man. I had a vision, I had a dream of him. Now Pilate questions Jesus. Pilate's trying to do the right thing, but you have to understand that Pilate is under a lot of pressure. So let me read to you from John 18, 33 to 37. 
Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now look at with me in Mark chapter 15 verse 6. Now at the feast, Pilate was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And in Luke 23, verse 14 to 15, it says, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, as Pilate is speaking. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I, have, I find no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. Neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. But the crowd begins to shout. Now imagine the pressure on Pilate. Now Pilate is trying to do the right thing. But just like how politicians are, some of them are not you know, sticking to their integrity. Many of them compromise because of the pressure of the people. It's hard for me to truly respect someone who is swayed by the crowd. I truly respect leaders who stick to their integrity who won't compromise just because of the pressure. But here, Pilate was trying to do the right thing, but he was being pressured. And look what happens. In Luke 23, verse 21 to 22, it says, But they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Then Pilate said to them a third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him, I will chastise him, and then I will let him go. So Pilate was still hoping he could convince the crowd to not want to crucify Jesus. So they flogged him in hope that it would be enough so they could let him go. Now the flogging. The flogging was intended to bring a victim to a state just short of death. The whip, also called a scourge or the cat of nine tails, would have nine leather strands some with round iron pieces on the end which would cause deep bruising and, and the other strands would have pieces of sharp bones or metal which would grip and cut deep into the skin and into the muscles and every time they would strike the individual it would also rip off flesh when they would pull off the cat of nine tails. There would be large amounts of blood loss and the excruciating pain would definitely be enough to put anyone into shock. In John 19, 1-3, it tells us, So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers, they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him. They beat him with their hands. John 19, 4, Pilate went out again and said to them behold i am bringing him out to you that you may know that i find no fault in him Pilate is hoping look we chastise him he's bleeding almost bleeding to death we have already punished him but listen i don't find any fault in him so we should let him go jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe and Pilate said, look, behold, the man. Hoping that it would appease the crowd to see Jesus beaten and bloodied. And when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they were not appeased. They cried out even more, saying, crucify him, crucify him. 
let him be crucified. And Pilate replied, You take him, and you crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Let me read to you John chapter 19, verse 7 to 11. The Jews answered him, saying, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that, saying, he was more afraid, and went again to the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Pilate is, is, is wanting an answer to, to spare Jesus. And he's asking Jesus, You know, speak to me. Don't you know that I have the power to release you or the power to crucify you? Speak to me. Give me reason to let you go. Give me reason to, to stand up to the crowds. Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Jesus knows what's going on with Pilate's heart. He knows that Pilate is struggling. He knows that Pilate sees in Jesus a just man. Pilate doesn't want to crucify him. But Jesus knows that this has to happen. And Jesus says, look, the greater sin is not you, Pilate. The greater sin are those who delivered me to you. Those are the ones that have the greater sin on their hands. And then Luke 23, verse 25 they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And they began to shout out, Give us Barabbas! Give us Barabbas! And in Matthew 27, 24, when Pilate saw the uprising and saw that he could not prevail, he took water and washed his hands, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. So you see, Pilate knew that Jesus was just. And Pilate didn't want anything to do with the situation. He was like, look, I'm not the one sentencing this just man. You are. And Pilate released to them the one they requested, Barabbas. Do you remember Barabbas, the one who was sitting in the cell among his fellow rebels, knowing that he was about to be crucified, knowing that he was going to be sentenced to the most excruciating death, a death that he deserved, a death that he deserved because of the crime that he committed. But they released Barabbas, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but Pilate delivered Jesus to their will. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 26, such a powerful verse, it reads, And he delivered him to be crucified. He delivered him to be crucified. The Lamb of God, the Savior of the world, now will begin his journey on Via Dolorosa, the road to Calvary, carrying the cross, the same cross that he would be crucified on. And at this time, while well, Jesus was about to carry his cross, Barabbas was set free. Barabbas was set free. That Jesus took his place. It wasn't Pilate who sentenced Jesus. It wasn't the people. It was Christ who set him free by being his substitute, by taking his place. All of us are in bondage to sin. And just as Barabbas was in bondage because of a crime that he committed, all of us are in bondage because of the sin that we committed.
but Christ came to set us free. That is why Christ came to set us free, to set us free from that bondage, to set us free from that punishment, to set us free from the price that we should have paid, the price that we should have paid. And in John 8, 34, as Jesus mentions earlier in the Gospel of John, He says, Most assuredly I say unto you, whoever commits a sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And here, the Son of God is the one who set Barabbas free. Now I have a question for you. Could it be that the three crosses were actually prepared for the three rebels? Were the three crosses prepared for the three rebels? It is a high possibility that two, the two who would be crucified with Jesus, high possibility that they were co-rebels with Barabbas. For the Gospel of Matthew calls them insurrectionists, and their crucifixion indicates that they were judged guilty for more than just robbery. The fact that three crosses were prepared strongly suggests that Pilate had already ordered that preparations be made for the execution of those three rebels. The cross that Christ was crucified on was not supposed to be His. Are you hearing me this morning? The cross that the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world, the only begotten Son of God, the cross that He would be crucified on was not supposed to be His. That cross was really for Barabbas. That cross was really for Barabbas. And you know, when it comes to Scripture, when it comes to the things of God, I don't believe that there's things by coincidence I always believe that God works by divine appointment. I believe that God works by divine purpose. And I believe that Barabbas is more than just this man Barabbas. That Barabbas represents you and I. And the reason why I say that is because if you look at the name of Barabbas, Bar means son, and Abba means father. And Barabbas' name actually translates son of the father. Son of the father. Listen, he took our place. He took the place of you and I. The cross that he was crucified on was a cross that belonged to you and I. He took your place because you are his child. He took your place because you are a son or daughter of the Father. Whose cross was it? It was yours. It was mine. It was everyone's. Romans 5.8 tells us, For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. 
Few will die for a righteous man. And maybe for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the price that no one else could ever pay. He paid a price He didn't know because you and I owed a price we could not pay. And the whole time, as He carried His cross to Calvary, the whole time when He was being flogged, the time when they put the crown of thorns and smashed it upon His head, He had one thing on His mind. You and I. You and I. And He desires for you to understand that and to receive the salvation that comes with the price that He paid for you and I. God came to offer salvation and all you have to do is to believe it and to receive it. Two simple steps. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to search for it. All you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. All that matters this morning is that you understand that there was a price to be paid because of sin and Jesus Christ took it upon Himself. That He took your place so that you and I could be set free. He took our place and salvation has already come through Christ. But every person is responsible for them to believe, to confess, and to receive Him as Lord and Savior. If that's you this morning, and you're saying, Pastor Paul, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I realize the price that He paid for me. I realize that He took my place. And I realize that He is the only hope. He's the only place where I can find salvation and forgiveness of my sins. If that's you this morning, I want to invite you to pray this prayer of salvation. And I want you to understand that it's a suggested prayer, that the power is not in the words itself, but the power is in your belief, in your heart, and the confession of your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior over all. If you want to take this step, the biggest step of your lifetime, please pray with me this morning. Let's bow our heads and repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I know that I deserve the penalty for my sin. But because of your great love for me, you died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sin. And on the third day, you rose again, conquering sin and now offering me eternal life. I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that you are Lord and Savior over all. Take control of my life and may your Holy Spirit guide me all my days. I choose to live my life for the glory of your name. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior, for I ask it in the most loving and precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I want to welcome you to the family and kingdom of God. 
get connected to a church, invest in a good Bible, get into His Word daily, and shine for the glory of His name. Know that there are other Christians out there that are there to encourage you and to help you on your new journey with Christ. And I pray that as you shine for His glory, that you would understand that the Lord and Savior of the universe is now the Lord and Savior of your life. I pray that you've been blessed by this message, and I pray that you'll join us again this coming week for Resurrection Week. For this Easter week, I pray that you'll tune in for our messages. We're going to have a message on Thursday night. We're going to have a message on Friday morning and on Sunday morning for Resurrection Sunday. Tune in, share it, invite your friends to watch it with you. And I pray the Lord will bless you and speak volumes to your heart that you cannot contain. Have a blessed week. I'm praying for you all. Love you. And may the Lord bless you and cover you. In Jesus' name, amen.